There we are. Hi, everybody. This is Vicki Ronchetti with Show Dog Prep School for our Breeder of Inner Influence uh, interview with Suzanne Clothier. I'm so excited about this. And I always start these interviews out with how I met the person or how I know about them or their breeding program. But this is extra special <laughs> because Suzanne is actually um, one of my mentors. And I, you know, I'm not going to say idol, but, you know, I have so much respect and love for her. Uh, everything or a lot of what I teach and do has just trickled down from her learnings. Um, so I've, I've seen her too many times to count in person. I've worked with her with my dogs and I learned about her first from her this book. Look, at this is even actually I believe, one of my sign copies. <laughs> Um, a bones would rain from the sky. And when I read this book, it was like, it was when I was just first becoming a positive trainer and, and there weren't a lot of books on positive training, but like everything was very, uh, you know, this is the science of it. This is what you need to know now. This is all the learning theory. And this was a book that really taught, told you that it was okay to think about how the dog's feeling, which is very intuitive for me. That's I can't help it. I mean, I know that they're not people, but I am a person and that's how I have to look at things. So it gave us permission to to think about what the dog might be feeling or thinking or that kind of thing. So I'm really excited about this interview because I've talked to Suzanne a lot and learned a lot from her about training, but to really get to pick her mind about breeding and her breeding program is exciting. Okay, Really exciting. So uh, the first thing I want to say is that We've done several of these interviews and we're going to do several more, but this is the first one that I'm doing with somebody who is not uh, breeding dogs to be uh, in the AKC show ring. I mean, I'm sure they could, but that's not like the full force of her breeding program. Suzanne's dogs do all sorts of different things. Um, and so Suzanne, tell us about that. Tell us who Hawks Hunt German Shepherds is and what it is. Well, to avoid running the risk of offending people that are showing shepherds in the <laughs> Um, been there, done that, decided that I wanted to play on a different planet. Um, I have bred dogs for the show ring. When I bred Britney's for five years, I, I co-bred Britney's with uh, Kitty Murphy of Sequani Kennels, one of the, the big Britney kennels back in the day. Yeah. Um, yeah, the last, every litter, we had a puppy that was mine to choose from the litter. So I, she had Meniere's disease and couldn't do the physical work. So I was like 25. I'm like, I'll do it. I'll do all the grunts. <laughs> You know, um, that's how you learn. So for five years, I had I had letters with Kitty, and so I raised them, conditioned them, did the the whole gig, and and every litter I got one puppy that I got to choose was mine to do with as I please. So the last litter that we uh, did, I chose this puppy when he was ten days old, and he was the national specialty winner, American, Canadian, Bermudan champion with titles on both ends. So, wow, been there, done that with the show ring, right? Um, I also happen to have rescued, rescued, go figure, a, <laughs> a group quality deer hound who unfortunately, you know, first time out of the box, took a five point major. People are like, where did this dog come from? Like, well, I kind of rescued him and he just turned out to be a group quality dog. Um, but then he got really, really sick. But before he got sick, he went reserve at the garden to the dog who won the hound group that year. Wow. So, yeah. Um, been around the show ring and Went and spent a lot of time in the German Shepherd show world. Um, my first shepherd was kind of an all breed dog, which in the shepherd world is, is, is uh, almost an insult. Well, I guess he would do okay in the all breed ring. <laughs> um, and I thought, okay, so you know, you should get a, a real dog for, for the specialty ring. And I thought, okie dokie. So I did that. And so one of them turned out to be dysplastic and looked a great deal like a coyote. I placed her with a really nice old lady. The next one was, uh, I paid four thousand dollars for that dog in nineteen eighty four. Wow! Yeah, completely insane, right? Yes, he was dead before he was two of autoimmune, like the rest of his litter. Um, soon followed, and I thought, you know what? And I did. I did one more try, and I thought, you know what? I have this good, solid dog who's just—he's just sound. He's just sound, and he's sound, and he's sound. He lived to be fifteen, and he was actually the foundation. I thought. I'm just going to breed more like him. And if the specialty judges sneer at him, he's athletic, he's mentally sound, I'm, I'm really okay. Yeah. And the day, the day I walked away from the, the, you know, the specialty ring and Shepherds was, I had a, a booth with my artwork at the Shepherd National. And I looked up and I thought, that's weird. You know, 
bitches. It wasn't bitches. It was open dogs. Oh. Couldn't tell the difference. Wow. Yeah, I'm going home now. I'm mm -hmm. just playing my own game. So I'm on generation number 10 of German Shepherds. You know, my mom, if she was still alive, would tell you that I would interrupt almost anything I was doing on the planet, except maybe talk to a horse. If Rick <laughs> Finn was on, I was like, gotta go. And now I watch the old Rindy shows. I'm like, he bit a lot of people. <laughs> I'm like flying off of roofs and taking bad guys off their horses and, and biting people. I was like, oh, wow, interesting. I don't know how that influenced me as a trainer. You know, I, I don't think my dog should bite. So we're on generation number 10 now, which is pretty amazing. And at any given time, I almost always have four generations in the house. So we tend to breed for health. Health and temperament, because if you have a good temperament, but you're not healthy, what's the point of that? You can be healthy as hell, and if you get a poor temperament, what's the point of that? Right. And he's got to be able to enjoy his life and live to, to be an old, old dog. Um, so there's uh, the Shepherd Club of America has what they call the 13 Club. And it, it makes me really sad that they actually hand out a certificate to you know, celebrate the fact that the dogs made it to 13. If any of the dogs we breed die before they're 13, I'm utterly shocked. Yeah. I'm shocked. So that's what is your average lifespan for one of your guys? 13 to 14, 13 to 14. We've had yeah. many make 15. And then, you know, we've got Angio in the breed and that's impossible to breed around or against because no one even knows how it's transmitted. Um, so that, that still wipes them out at, at horribly young ages from seven to 11, we've lost dogs. Um, but past that, knock on wood, yeah, we've, we've gotten rid of the, the big stuff. Um, and it's, it's a hard breed to be successful in. There's no two mm -hmm. ways about it. There's, there's a lot of, um, there's just a lot. I think we're number two in the world for genetic disorders. Poodle's number one. So for once, we're glad to be number two. Um, <laughs> yeah. So tell us how come it's called Hox Hunt, because you know I love hawks. Oh, yeah. There was a an early period of my life when for reasons that aren't worth discussing. I was, I was forced to live with strangers for a while, and it was just, it was awful. It was a, it was a really kind lady and her two toddlers, and I'm not as fond of children as I am of dogs. They were, they were nice kids. And um, we only had, it was just awful. All I could see every day that kept me sane was there was a mountain that I could see out the, out the window and I'd sit there with my cup of tea. And what I would watch is the big red tail hawk just hunting. Mm -hmm. And I swore like, when I get through this period of my life, I am always going to live where hawks hunt. And I always have. I love that. Yeah, because I love hawks. I mean, and I live in a, you know, very, you know, little suburban area. So like seeing a hawk in San Leandro is like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I got to follow it. Where is it coming from? Um, so I is it safe to guess that you did not grow up in a dog showing or breeding family? <laughs> no, no. And you know that if you've read Bones. <laughs> Far from it. My poor mother was just I don't know how. At age 14, I convinced her to let me run like a boutique boarding kennel in the basement. I have no idea. <laughs> so, like, you know, we would just take on one one dog at a time. But since I couldn't have a dog of my own, I just kept <laughs> I just kept getting everybody else's dogs every two weeks or a week or whatever. It worked for me. I, I rotated through a lot of, of dogs, everything from a miniature schnauzer to some little shih tzu thing that just would bite everybody in the ankle. It was awful. Um, and the cats, occasionally we boarded cats. That went very badly. <laughs> very upset cats that would attack anything that came down there. So, yeah, no, I would not say that, but all my life, um, my mother, you know, when I was very young, neighbors would knock on the door and ask, do you have our dog? And she'd say, of course not. And then she learned to say, let me go find Suzanne. Because, yes, of course, <laughs> of course, you've stolen your dog and is in the closet with it hiding. So, yeah, that's that's been lifelong. If I was missing, first they look for any live animals in the in the environment, and that's probably where they would find me. So tell us about, you told us a little bit about the, that first dog, but tell us more about your foundation animals in your breeding program, like beyond the one that you had when you started going to look for, for you know, to create a breeding program and put that together. What did you do? Where did those dogs come from? And Or, or more well, importantly, tell us about the dogs. Yeah, so so Bear was my first dog, and 
you know, if you if you could pick, pick up Anna Catherine Nichols's, you know, uh, big book of the German Shepherd, it's his father on the back cover and his grandfather on the cover. It's not that he had, you know, some kind of wonky backyard pedigree. He was from some of the top breeders, you know, in in the in the states. So I worked with them, and, and they were my mentors, um, one of them, and it just. It just turned out to be a, a bad choice. You live and you learn, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you get smarter. Um, it it made me very um, aware of what I did and did not want. And I think that's the hardest part of of being a breeder because after big disappointments, when that that, that fancy show dog died, right? I, I really admired his dad, and I I really liked his grandmother immensely, and I thought. All right, let's let's go with that. I'm I'm just gonna figure out where I'm gonna get this crazy amount of money. I'm gonna do this, um, and you you want to talk about heartbreaking? It's you bring your your dog who just threw up a giant pot, well, bucket of bile, and the the vet examines him, then comes in, and the very first question he has is, "How valuable is this dog to you?" I was like, "This is not a good question to hear." Right, right. He was he was dead 24 hours later of kidney failure. Uh. So this is what starts to sort out the, you know, the crazy people, the breeders who are like, I can, I can figure this out. And for many people that kind of set back dog after dog after dog, you just start to think, I can't do this. So well, why am I doing this? Yeah. Like, <laughs> to <well>. myself. <laughs> I, I could just hit myself in the head with a hammer when I wanted to, you know, feel pain and it'd probably be less expensive for sure. Um, it's not the money, it's, it's the love of the breed. And I just thought, I, I just want to get this right. So the next bitch turned out, a friend of mine panicked because the dog came up lame and the, the vet so like, this dog probably has elbow dysplasia. She'll be crippled the rest of her life, blah, 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 blah. So I went very carefully through the pedigree and I was like, just really isn't a lot of elbow dysplasia here. And yeah. she said, well, I'm just going to spay her and place her. I said, then you're a moron. You're crazy. Just give me the dog. I will take her. And that was my foundation brood bitch. Wow. Four. And one of them is probably an injury, but I'll take four elbow dysplasias in all of my years of breeding. Wow. So that was, that was a calculated risk on my part. Um, yeah. And she actually stayed sound till she died at 14. So figure wow. um yeah and and from her i just kept breeding then i did some cooperative breeding with guiding eyes for the blind because they really liked how sound my dogs were mentally and physically um so that worked out really well and i just i just wanted to produce dogs that were that were good companions that could do almost anything you pointed them at right. and we but you know i mean I, I get the thrill, you know, like, you know, somewhere there's the ribbon from the garden and, and whatever. That's not as thrilling to me as like Therapy Dogs of Vermont was founded by two German shepherds from my lines. It started yeah. with one man and his two shepherds, and it's now in multiple hospitals in Vermont, and I think they have 125, 150 dog teams. Wow. Yeah, and it was Lillian Jordan who... <clears throat> started that so that that pleases me more you know than any ribbon on the planet um yeah that i think that i think that you know seeing you know so many times you speak and lecture i feel like you know we sort of get to know your dogs through you know like your teaching and stuff like that and i remember one time i think i don't remember what the talk was i want to say it was like adolescent dogs but we were talking about just um you know, the, a stable temperament in a dog, like with a lot of work or without a lot of work, just a dog that's okay and sound. And I think it was spider and you went to, um, you went to like a training facility and you were able to just kind of hand this dog to anybody. And she was just like, okay, okay, okay. And I love that because that is not, I mean, it's like in, my, in California, German shepherds are like really good or really bad. Like it just in terms of like coming to the grooming shop as a, as a trainer in the community, that kind of thing. Just don't see that sort of stability across the. No, I, I think the board. trick is that I breed for the whole dog, right? So I, I breed for, it has to be this balance of temperament, structure, um, health, everything has to go together. 
I don't yeah. breed for dreams. I'm not breeding for what is in fad in the show ring. I mean, one of the things I loved about breeding Britneys is at that point, they were not a particularly fancy show dog. You know, they've become more popular. But back in those days, like back at the AKC Centennial, like the Brittany that was showing there, that was that was a dog I had a lot to do with. And he lived with me for years and I conditioned him, you know, by running him off horseback for hours. <laughs> so he as a fiddle. But it was not unusual in the Brittany world. We would be showing um, Futurity Maturity the night before. And then the next morning we're on horseback and, and get to work now. Let's go, get these guys working. Yeah. Uh, so I, I appreciated that because that balance had to be there. I mean, as pretty as you are, if you if you can't go work in the hunt field, what, what the hell use are you? Um, right. That's not true in the shepherd world where there's such a huge distinction between working lines and show lines. And it's like, hey, you know, the big German herding test, the Hagi Ha, um, one of the first ones to get that title in this country came out of my lines. So can these dogs work? That's 150 to 200 sheep one dog hour and a half test wow that is a very serious test of, of stability working ability you know mm -hmm. so I, I breed for the whole thing and um yeah I, I like stable animals i mean people come here to the farm they're like your animals are all so sane it's like because <laughs> i like them that way i'm not a fan of of having to compensate uh, and i just took four dogs to the vet last week and every one of them some of them have not been to the vets in a, a year, year and a half. They're just healthy. Yeah. Um, I handed them off to a person they'd never seen. Um, they're like, see you later. They just sailed off. And they live with a like whole host. A adventure in the wagon, like, yeah. <laughs> and they live with a whole host of other animals. So tell us about what, what else do you have at your farm? Everything, um, right? This, mor this morning I was making coffee and I hear, ah! And I'm like, what the hell? There's only one dog loose. I know where the two cats are. I'm like, what exactly did you get yourself into? So I go around the corner and the Scarlet Macaw is um, barking. Walking around. No, she's walking around on the floor. I'm like, oh. exactly how did you get out of your cage, sweetie? She's like, well, remember your husband who doesn't remember things? Yes, he didn't latch the thing. So I, I realized that and I pushed my bowl out and then I climbed out. And now I'm <laughs> Ah, yeah. So um, we have an umbrella cockatoo, a scarlet macaw, a blue front Amazon, two cats live in the house, seven dogs, two sulcata tortoises live in the in the house during the winter. And then outside we have a herd of Scottish Highland cattle, a pony, two horses, two donkeys, an elderly pig, another barn cat, and uh, I don't know, maybe a dozen, 10 hens, 10 old laying hens. So, I just started chickens this during the lockdown. I saw that. Aren't they so, the best? They're, they're so the fun. best. They're ridiculous. I mean, I thought, okay, this will be like parrots. It will probably take some time. I'm like, they climb all over me. They're they're just like so intuitive. And, you know, and I've had to do some kind of like one got a swollen eye and I really had to get in there and get a bunch of junk out of it. And, and like, they're so forgiving. She's just like, the next day was like, I feel so much better. You know, and she's just all jumping all over me again. I was like, wow. <laughs> No, I, I love my laying hens. I do. I do. We had one that got attacked by um, a guest dog and uh, it, she was, she was very involved with the pig at the time. And, and so the poor pig could only watch the attack and he was helpless to hope her. And I thought she was going to die, but I bandaged her up. I sewed her up myself. That was just crazy. Um, but I did it. And then she lived in my, in my bedroom for two weeks. Oh. And so every day I'd sit around the end of my bed and I'd take all the bandages off and I'd put all the bandages back on. She's like, okay, I got it. And she'd, she'd lay a little egg and I'd take it out to <laughs> the pig and he would, because she would always lay. The egg for him and then he would eat it. I brought the egg out and he sniffed it and then he wouldn't eat it. He carried it around for a while. <laughs> then I went and got Amelia. I'm like, Connor, look, Amelia's still alive. And he was like, <gasps> Oh, he was like, oh, I know you thought she was dead. She's not dead, honey. And he said, oh. But then later that fall, she learned he had a wife and piglets in the barn, and then it was all over. But anyway, <laughs> that was a summertime affair between the pig and the chicken. Um, so do you have, do you feel like you have a, for your breeding program? Because when I was, I, I still have dachshunds, of course, I'm still doing dachshunds. But when I was sort of being mentored in dachshunds, it was like, 
you know, you sort of did line braiding and line braiding and then you went out and then you came back in and then I got Lao Chen that are rare. And so you sort of don't do that. It's like, oh, we don't do that. You know, they're too close. So you're always trying to outcross. Do you have like a, a formula or like a, something that you always go back to, or is it just, you're always just looking for something new to bring in? How do you, how do you do that? I, I swear to God. I mean, I understand all the technicalities of that. <laughs> I do. I do. And then I have what I think of as the cosmic breeding plan, which has worked out pretty well so far. Um, which is I want to breed to dogs that are um, as balanced and whole as I can. A total outcross is fine with me. I, I don't care. But at times I have line bred, um, you know, like an uncle to a, we've gone fairly close sometimes. Um, and then I just go out to an outcross. And mm -hmm. so I would say outcross is, is much more typical than line breeding for me. And it's just that I'm looking for, it's got to be a dog that really, he has to suit me. It's not like, oh, I really hate that rear, but I'll breed to it anyway, because like, nope, the whole package has to work for me or I'm not doing it. So that's that's paid off um, in a big way. And then of course, my vet at one point, she said, well, your dogs are so special because you so carefully line breed. And I started laughing. I'm like, no, <laughs> let's look at that pedigree. I don't know how many generations back you'd have to go. I once, as a curiosity one winter, did that. I took a pedigree and I went to pedigree database and I went back and 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 back. I was like, well, I got the 20 pet, 20 generations back. I'm like, not finding any common ancestors. But by the same token, that gives me some flexibility when I do an up close breeding. I've done half brother, half sister. Mm -hmm. that was that turned out really nice. Um, and then I, then the next move will be out to an outcross. Absolutely. Um, so when you look for an outcross, you're looking for like the, the whole dog, you know, the uh, dog that you feel is like as a whole, as stable in all ways as what you're going to breed to it. So are you interested in that dog's pedigree and whether he's outcrossed or line bred or, or what it looks like behind him? Yeah, I would say most of the, the dogs that I've outcrossed to, they are outcrossed um, because a lot of the European breeders don't do a lot of line breeding, right? Um, so one of the goals is I have to have a, I have to have an honest breeder, number one. Right. Like if I don't have an honest breeder, I don't care how beautiful the dog is. If I cannot trust what that breeder is going to tell me about health and issues that have popped up, then I'm just spinning my wheels and I won't even go there. However, I mean, if, they, I mean, if they say, oh, we don't have any of that in our lines. <laughs> as, soon as, they say that, as soon as they say that sentence, I know they're lying or stupid. Yeah. I can't decide which, and I'm not interested in finding out. But I once someone asked me once, um, you know, like, what problems do you have in your line? So I sent her a really long email. It's like, we've had this, this, this. And she's like, I cannot believe you're willing to put this in print. I'm like, if I don't put it in print, how is it that I actually care for my breed? Right. I don't know what the problems are and then I'm not alert to them and I don't know how to try to breed around them or get rid of them or select away from something, then I'm an idiot. Uh, and I'm, I'm not doing the breed that I love so much a, a service at all. So I, I have, I have no respect for breeders that put their head in the sand like, well, we don't have that. Or I'm sure the owner caused that. More owners get blamed for stuff. I'm telling you. It's like, forgot when that dog that I bought died, right? You know, he was dead before he was two. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know what the breeder said? Well, it's probably the raw diet you fed him and killed him. And that's the, that's what she spread at the national that she and her wacko diets. And when in fact, my vet was not a fan of raw diets. This is back in the eighties, right? I was feeding raw diets and everybody thought I had bones in my nose. Um, the vet said, no, I, I think the opposite. I think that the fact that he showed no signs whatsoever until the crash was because he was so healthy because yeah. of everything you did to support him. So I'm, I'm really a big fan of, you got to be honest and you got to tell me what you've got. And I, I also understand that many of the breeders that I would use, um, it's word of mouth. I hear about them kind of sideways. I'm not looking to breed to big, fancy, flashy dogs. And sometimes I'm the first person to breed to that dog. That's happened more than a few times. And so then, do you have breeders that you're going to, or do you just, or do you just like see a dog somewhere 
or hear about a dog somewhere and then go and try and do that? Or do you have like already set up relationship? You know what I mean? Like, come back, are, Nikki. Are you back? Yeah, you I'm back. I think we both froze for a second. <laughs> um, so what I was asking was, do you, when you go to out to another breeder, are you going to a breeder based on their line of dogs or do you just sometimes hear about a dog like an individual and then go there and find out that oh I like all, a lot of what they have behind there or going yeah, on there it's, it's been often you know someone's recommended a dog you know there was a, the guide school that I worked with I said who, who are you guys looking at so they sent me up to a breeder in New Hampshire small little breeder and I don't even remember how they found her but yeah I, I went and looked at her dogs and I was like Okay, read the two of them. Really, really liked what I got. Um, another one was word of mouth recommendations. So, you know, two breeders out in Michigan that I really liked. Very different. You know, one was really focused on IPO Schutzen kind of work. The other one, she does quite a bit of showing in UKC and all that. Her dogs are structurally um, just gorgeous. Um, and yeah, but I, I have to be able to connect with that breeder and trust that they're going to tell me the truth. So there's times when I talk to people on the phone, it's like, okay, thank you. It's like, mm, no, this is not a match. We we have to be able to, we have to share a real commitment to this breed and to honesty about the breed and to really caring what happens to these puppies. Yeah. And almost I always I've had to have a recommendation. Like I've had to have someone vouch for me to say you can let her breed to your dog. She is a responsible breeder. And because there's a lot of wackos, you know, that call like, hey, I got a bitch in heat. So can I breed to your dog today? It's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> We've gotten those calls and I just, yeah. But, I remember yeah. one time I was looking at a, um, a miniature dachshund for a bitch that I co-owned with a friend and and I was looking at this dog and he was a really nice little dog and he'd done a lot of winning and so uh, you know at a big show I asked if I could go over him and see him and she stacked him up and I and I said can I hold him and she was like um, yeah Isn't that weird you want to hold him and I'm like, yeah I want to see what this dog does if a stranger is whole I want to see who he is yeah. you know but it was kind of like whoa you actually need to do more than just assess his body. <laughs> it's like, no, I know what he looks like. I want to know who he is now, you know, like, exactly. so do you find that that kind of, um, you know, more outcrossy breeding gets you less like consistency and look and are you okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. I'm okay with that. So there was a point where I had to make a decision, right. To cooperatively breed with uh, guiding eyes for the blind, which is fine. So, on the one side, the temperament's going to be pretty solid. I mean, you know, guide dog stock. However, looks are the last thing on their list. So there was there was one dog I bred to. It was actually a spider's dad. I mean, just spectacular temperaments. I mean, just we have really good temperaments, but this is just like beyond. Everyone wants spider. Um, but dear God, a tail set like an Akita. It's like what the <laughs> hell. I kind of swallowed hard, you know, and, and if you see Spider, you would laugh because she's, she's quite typey. Um, she's quite beautiful. But I knew I was going to lose some type. It's like, but I'm also going to pick up known, a really deep known health history. Uh -huh. so, so I did that for a while, and, and then it's like, okay, now it's starting to bug me. They're starting to look like coyotes. Um, <laughs> they're still, they're just too leggy, right? They're too leggy. Um, they're strong as hell. You know, they're athletic. We just call the, the youngsters in the house the airborne division because I'm not <laughs> joking. They go from the bay window, they bounce off the couch under the bay window, and then across the room. So it's a good eight, <laughs> eight nine feet to the futon. Oh, my God. That's just – and sometimes they'll just sail over us and the couch to, to land on the floor and then bounce off onto the futon. That's just how they transverse the room which is startling when you forget there's like an 85 pound male <laughs> sleeping in the bay window. And then he thinks, Oh, I'd like to get from here to there. And suddenly you're just, you know. so they're, they're very, very strong, but you know, I, I really love, I love the look of a really good shepherd, not an extreme dog. I want a really solid balanced dog. So yeah, there's, you have to decide what you're going to select. And I will always sacrifice some typiness for health and temperament. There's no two ways about it. I don't care how beautiful you are. If you're a fruit loop or you're not healthy, what is the point? Yeah. There's no point. 
What are, so you, you mentioned that, um, you know, your dogs have been used in um, that one program. What else, what else do they do? Cause I know that people have, have gotten dogs from you to do all sorts of things. Yep. I long ago gave up doing competitive sports. It just is like a busman's holiday for me. There's no, no joy in my bill. Um, but my dogs, you know, and actually once I did search and rescue with my own dog, that I was done. Like there was, there was no ring that held any appeal to me ever again after that. So our dogs have been competitive in everything except Schutz and IPO. And that's not because they can't do the work. It's just that we just don't tend to have handlers do it. We had one that was already there and then she said, I'm too old, I'm retiring. I'm like, just put the title on the dog, <laughs> then retire. I don't care how old you are, stop it. But she retired anyway. Um, but like I said, that that great big hurt, you know, hurting degree, um, that title, which is considered the equivalent of a Schutzen three, that <laughs> that was a a little bit over a two year old dog out of our lines. So they have wow. a really nice herding instinct, um, uh, multiple tracking dogs, tracking champion. Uh, they've done everything except succeed in the show ring. And some of them probably could succeed either in the Canadian all breed ring, maybe the American all breed ring. It's a crazy place. Um, UKC, they'd probably do fine, but mostly we don't care much about show dogs. Yeah. Everything else you can think of um, tracking, trailing, herding. We've had top 10 in agility. Um, you know, we had one dog that should so many titles. It's just ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. Um, but she was smoking border collies at 30 inches in USDAA. <laughs> and <laughs> kind of made the border collie people not happy because she did it so smoothly and she was so efficient because she was so well structured that they're like, how is that possible that that dog just beat our, our border collie time? So she did. So, yeah, pretty much if you can aim them at it, they can do it. We have one dog up in Alaska that's done um, working with biologists for yes or looking for the nests of lesser yellow legs. Yeah. Wow! No, so they can pretty Pull much out. they can do just about anything, just about anything you ask them to. They've been used as guide dog stock, you know, breeding stock, and yeah, we're very proud of our dogs. It's it's the all around, all purpose dog. And then you just get these great photos of kids that have grown up, you know, thinking that their German Shepherd buddy is the best couch on the planet, and that's their pillow and that's their safety blanket and. But that's as good as it gets for me. Mm -hmm. Totally. So who are some of your favorite Hawks hunt dogs? Well, that's a, that's a rude question. <laughs> How can you ask that? I've been <laughs> generations of dogs. God. Uh, all you of must have had a couple that were just like, we love all our dogs, but this one really yeah. lived on a pedestal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so dog number one, Bear, who... I got when he was nine months old as my first dog. And unfortunately he'd been raised by an alcoholic who sometimes was friendly to the dog, sometimes wasn't. So this dog just learned people are not particularly trustworthy. When in doubt, just lay down, <laughs> just <laughs> lay down. Cause if he's drunk, he might start swinging a pooper scooper at you. So when in doubt, bear just hit the deck and waited to see how the, the storm was gonna roll. And then once he got attached to me, when people say, you don't understand with separation anxiety, I'm like, yeah, I do. Because I once <laughs> came up, this dog would get so frantic if he couldn't see me. Um, it took me a while to work this out. There was nothing wrong with him temperamentally, but he'd had such a crappy childhood. And so I would have to pop out of the, the barn I was working in and be like, I'm still here, buddy. And he's like, okay. And I got stuck holding a horse for a vet, so I didn't pop out in time in the early days. When I had just gotten him and I came back out and the entire, the entire interior of my car is coated in stress shit. Uh, oh, I, you have not lived. So you've had a toothbrush and you're trying to get the, the, oh. the diarrhea out of the buttons of your car. Oh. Anyway. Yeah. He went on. I mean, this is the dog I took to, to New Year's Eve in Times Square twice. Twice. He went to the Elton John concert with 400,000 people in Central Park. Didn't bat an eye. Um, he just wasn't going to let go of me once he, he got there. But, man, he produced super solid puppies. So Bear was exceptional. I mean, my son said recently, he's 42 this Christmas. <laughs> he said, for a while, he said, I believe that Bear was my brother. I was like, well, you, you could have had a much worse brother than that German Shepherd for sure. 
Um, yeah, he, he was exceptional. Um, I don't know. I've had so many amazing dogs. Otter, Otter was just funnier than hell. I mean, uh, I once went to support a CGC just for the entry. It's like they're not realizing I'd never taken her to a dog show. So <laughs> he was like, what the hell? I'm like, I know, right? Did I forget to inform you about this stuff? <laughs> well, whatever, you're really fine. So she thought the whole thing was so stupid. And Otter believed that if this idea was good, then her idea was going to be five times better. <laughs> And so um, we're walking along on the loose leash, you know, portion of the show. And I see her look at me like, what is this, what is this stupid stuff? Like, what, we're not doing anything. And I see her look at the ring gate and I can see it in her head. She's like, if I jump in and out and in and out and in and out and in and out as we go around the ring, that'll be funnier. I'm like, don't do that. I left her on the stay. And so she's like, oh, I can stay, but why not show them that I can also be a bear on my hind leg? I'm like, is there a law? Is there something that says all four feet have to be on the ground? I don't think so. Then I called her and she came to me. And I forget what other trick she demonstrated, but the judge was just laughing his ass off. I was like, oh, Otter. Everyone that met Otter found her extremely funny. Um, wicked sense of humor. And then, you know, Spider, Spider is an outstanding. Everyone that knows Spider, I have people that bought puppies that are Spider kids or grandkids or great grandkids. Because when they saw her, they're like, that's what I want. I want a dog out of, out of, you know, that. So every single dog in my household descends from the original dog bear. Every one of them. That's so which cool. Which is really cool. And then my big guy, Stone, um, you can't even discuss Stone. Stone was, pff, he was Stone. <laughs> he was Stone. Yeah. What about outside of your breeding program? Any dogs that you really like? just love outside of your breeding program? We probably won't know any of them. They're probably in another country or in a, a little kennel that, because yeah. mostly everybody that talks about these big show dogs, I love talking about not big show dogs sometimes. It's fun, you know, that there's another way to go about this. It just, you know, like yeah. there are all different purposes you could have for breeding. And really it's about, Oh, the dogs that you're producing and putting out in the world and are you taking responsibility for them? You know, that's like what matters to me. Exactly. So you know? I think the dog I'm, I'm most in love with lately is, is uh, quest quest from Royal out of Michigan. And that's who our last litter was from. It broke my heart because of the pandemic. I made the decision not to have puppies this year because I couldn't mm. guarantee that I would be able to socialize them properly or get them to where they're supposed to go. And that's my idea of hell is that like yeah. 12 German shepherds that all have to stay here. <laughs> I might as well put a bullet in their head. It, it's just so not fair to them. So I opted not to breed again, but our last litter of, um, of the quest kids are, they're just stunning. I mean, they're, they're brilliant. He brought us back a whole lot of type. He himself is, is just a, a rock solid dog. Um, and his breeder, Gail Bauer just does amazingly good work. She has a really good eye for dogs. She's been in, in the world a long time. You know, when the two of us got together, her husband just rolled his eyes and left because it's like, we'll be here for hours. Yeah. <laughs> and remember that dog? Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, we were going to solve the world's troubles over some cookies <laughs> and, and coffee. It was all good. Um, yeah, I'm really quite smitten with him. And otherwise, I, I just don't spend a lot of time. I don't go to shows anymore. It's just too horrifying. It's just too awful to watch the dogs in the ring. Um, I'm ashamed to, to be part of that breed. It's it's just sad. They're either spooky or they look like they're broken. If you you know, I say to people, if you saw a wild animal walk across your yard looking like some of the show shepherds, you would call the wildlife guys and go, "Hey, someone's got to come out here and help this animal. They either need yeah. to be eyes or taken to a vet because something's very very wrong." And so that's that's really distressing to me because when you watch a shepherd doing that, the ground covering trot, it's not supposed to be a big flashy thing. It's supposed to be something they can sustain all day, all day. Um, you know, an endurance thing. So yeah, I don't I don't have a big long list of ooh, I hope I get to see that dog someday. <laughs> when I'm ready, I'll go looking for another dog. But until then, I'm not even any place where I'm looking. So, yeah, like I said, it's it's a weird cosmic approach, which has worked out not so bad for me all along the way. 
Well, I think that that's a good approach. I like the idea of looking at the whole dog. You know what I mean? Like not just, not just like how well you think they're going to do or needing to fix one little piece that you don't like. So then you go out and you're like, I just really want to fix fronts or something, you know, and then you, but then you're getting that whole, the whole individual that you're bringing in, not just a good front, you know? Right down to their digestive system. You know, you, you say something to a lot of people and they're like, oh, you know about shepherds and their stomachs. It's like, no, actually I don't. Because I don't, I breed for sound temperament. So it's really interesting to me that as I have bred for sound temperaments over and over and over again, yep, we'll get some exocrine pancreatic insufficiency because that's a genetic disorder. Um, and it, it's hard to, to breed away from. I mean, you can breed away from it, but you can't eliminate it completely. Um, but by and large, because our dog's temperaments are sound, we don't have dogs with trig. I mean, you know, it's it's a joke. We have dogs with pretty cast iron stomachs, and I always have. But now we're starting to learn that it's how healthy that gut is informs behavior and vice versa. So I find it yes. really interesting now that bioneurology is starting to show us, like, hey, um, maybe this dog's not, you know, behaviorally sound because he's not got a healthy gut. And vice right. versa. So when I'm breeding, it's like, don't don't show me dogs with chronic diarrhea. Don't you know, it's just no. Mm -mm. So the whole package is is more truly deeply the whole package than I think um, I ever understood. I just knew what I was after. Now science is just backing up that maybe there was some validity to my saying like, mm -mm. you know, like right now we've got allergies. They pop up from dog to dog. They're manageable but it drives me crazy. It's like, I don't know how to fix that. Yeah. Um, but you know, like you said, you want to fix fronts. Like, well, I learned the hard way. The genes that control the fronts don't control the rear. Like you've got to breed <laughs> the whole package. I know if only it were that easy, huh? Oh yeah. So the Dr. Frankenstein approach. <laughs> so, Ooh, I like his head, but yeah, <laughs> hmm, not so nice on the feet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So I have to tell you, when you just said that years ago, you talked about that in a workshop and it became a huge part of my work with show dogs, the the thing about the gut. And it's just like, because so much of the time it's like, well, he's not eating. And I'm like, well, you know, he's, or he's out on the road and he's not eating. And it's like, then he's not okay. You know? And it's like, well, yeah, but I think there's something with his gut. No, <laughs> I think there's, I mean, I think that there's not a problem. I think that we're might be making issues with his stomach because he's not okay emotionally. You know what I mean? Well, and then I think that there's also times where there's all these behavior problems, but really it's because the dog never feels well. Well, and it's accepted too. I mean, there's a reason right. in the show dog world, you know, ask the average dog owner if they know about satin balls. The answer is no. Yeah, or stuffing. Any, right. ser any serious dog owner, it's like, okay, so what's wrong with this picture? That you have to force feed an animal to go out and do a sport with them. Right. So every single one of my dogs, I swear to God, I can I can switch their food. The most they'll get is, is slightly soft food. It's like, hey, we're going to Canada, and now you're going to eat all your meals in this hotel room. We're going to live here for a week, which I did a couple years ago with Spider. And she's like, oh, all right. <laughs> the end. I don't have to take special food with me, but I, I try to get across to people. If you, if you took your grandson out and said, oh, we had the greatest weekend, you know, we went, you know, motocross and we did this and he loves that stuff. And, you know, he threw up and he had diarrhea most of the time. And then I had to force feed him. You're like, what? <laughs> Wait, did you say you went for fun? It's like, oh, yeah, <laughs> best time. We won all kinds of awards. Like, yes, but you had to force feed your child. You had to force feed a child. <laughs> So that he could like get through the weekend. What? It's insane. Right. And yet it's so accepted that we don't even appreciate the stress that we're putting these dogs under. Exactly. Right? You know, when I was running show handling classes, one of the things I was a, a bear about was let us please teach them the skills they need so that when they step in the ring, they know what to do. We once got tagged by a judge. He called the steward and he said, check the birth date on this dog. So it was a six to nine puppy, right? And I was like, what? Why is he asking the steward to check the time? And he accused us of putting a much older dog in a six to nine class. And I was outraged. And he, I said, on what basis? I mean, he clearly was a puppy for Christ's sakes, right? 
And he says, well, I've got open dogs who can't, you know, handle, you know, being stacked and moving around the room as, as, as well as this puppy. I was like, it's called training, sir. Yeah. Because at eight months old, if I said left, Bandit would just peel left. So it didn't matter how small the ring was. He heard left, he turned left. So he was as smooth as a little sports car. Say, so show yourself. And he's like, ta-da. I'm like, yeah, it's called training. So in my show handling classes, we taught all these skills. Right. We taught all the skills so that, including that the handler could walk in a straight line. <laughs> Always kind of helpful to the dog if the handler can move in a straight line. And we did everything on a loose leash. We taught them how to build up their muscles. We gave them physical therapy to actually address whatever their weak points were and make the most of their structure. And I loved it, man, because we would go out and dogs would like be winning and people would say, Where, where'd that dog come from? It's like, he's just gone through like eight weeks of Clothier's show handling class and he looked <laughs> like a different dog. But it was, it was all an illusion. But I wanted to take the stress out of it. So I'm like, this is not fun for these dogs. Don't it's not fun dog. for the people either if, they're, if they don't know what they're doing. It's horrible yeah. to show a dog that doesn't know what he's doing. And then you've got two individuals in there. No one knows what they're doing. And, Everybody's you know. Being stressed and unhappy. Yeah, and, exactly. And when in doubt, you know, choke them up. At one point I was involved with the Doberman Club. I, it's a long story. But anyway, it was when they were rewriting all the AKC standards. So this particular club that I was working with, we were tasked with reviewing the standards and that's when they were trying to, you know, standardize the standards, which was one of the stupider moves if you ask me, but. <laughs> so I was in charge of the movement week and it was really interesting because we had this cul-de-sac and we had a puddle. And so I said, okay, you know, go ahead and, and crank it up under the ear and eh, do this to them. And now we're gonna trot them through that puddle and then we're gonna look at their gait. And then we're gonna let them move with their head naturally held and there was a four inch difference in that dog's stride. Wow. And I said, if you want them to move in this posture, and this is just a carryover from my work with horses, is then teach him. So we actually taught them to move over Cavaletti using a target stick. <laughs> Bring yourself up, carry yourself, not I'm gonna choke you and yeah. uh, it's, it's- Don't you think the dogs appreciate that? Especially dogs who are really, you know, really problem solving dogs, working dogs. I feel like they're offended if you don't, if, if you're just like, I'll use my hands to make you do all this stuff. When they're like, um, I can do this stuff. <laughs> you know, like it's my body. Why don't you just... <laughs> yeah, I know how to stand. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but you know, you know, you watch people like pick up a leg and the poor dog, no one told them, hey, I'm going to pick up your leg. So they look like they're uprooting saplings. I thought, stop that. You can't do that to a horse. Like, how do we teach a horse to pick up a thing? First, we have to say, like, hey, buddy, can you shift your weight? And now can you give me this foot? So it was one of the first things we taught was foot. If I tap this, can you shift your balance? Give me now I can place this anywhere I want if I feel the need to hand stack you, which sometimes you do, right? Yeah. And a lady came back to class at Irish Wolfhound Puppy and she comes into class and she's all excited. She goes, this show handling class saved my dog's life. I'm like, I think that's a little bit of hyperbole. I don't know that any show handling class ever saved the dog's life. She goes, no, no, no. He fell down the well on our property. So this big Irish Wolfhound falls into this old stone well. So he's braced quite a few feet down, eight or 10 feet down. And so they had to get the fire department and the fire department says, we can get him out, but we gotta be able to get something past his front legs. Like, you know, how are we gonna do that? She goes, if you just tap him with the pole and tell him foot and God bless him, he did it. Oh. He lifted one foot, they got it under. They tapped the other foot, got it under, <laughs> got a sling. Out he came. It saved his life. I'm like, well, I'm literally. Sure. That is probably the only time in the history of mankind that show handling uh, techniques saved a dog's life. <laughs> um. So, I was really sad because I saw on one of my lists or something I was on one of the show dog lists. It said something about I'm so sad that there's no shows this year because I can't finish my bitch and I really wanted to breed her and I was thinking what. 
Like you're not going to breach your bitch because you can't finish her. Like since when does this piece come before this piece, right? Isn't it all about the, isn't the breeding the most important piece? And I'm sort of like, my brain has been really thinking about that a lot. And that's one of the reasons I was so excited about this interview with you, because I feel like it's not about like, just the idea of like the show ring coming before being a breeder to me is so backwards, right? It's like, it's, it's worse than that, Vicki. So number one, the number of dogs I've encountered of, of many, many, cause I, you know, I get to see dogs all around the world, right? Oh my God. The dogs that are champions who have God awful confirmation, they have serious working faults. I mean, the number of dogs I've seen with hyperextension of the Hawks, it's like, you know how like serious that is for a working dog? It, it bad temperament, all kinds of problems, and they're like, "But he's a champion." I'm like, "I'm really sorry. I I, I don't want to do that." Or the dogs that they show get their championship and immediately spare and neuter them because it's just another it's another title on their breeder's wall. It's like, no, see, right. the show ring is about presenting your breeding stock. Right. The purpose of the show ring, not I'm going to take this out of the out of the gene pool, but hey, can you give it some ribbons before I do that? Yeah, it makes me crazy. I'm like, no, 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 no. You should actually have to say I intend to breed this dog. I intend to pass the genetic clearances. I intend to actually do something with this dog to help support the breed I love. I'm not just trying to get an ROM on the mother or, you know. Nope, that it, it drives me absolutely bonkers. And I had a lady buy a dog. You know, I think of all the really lovely bitches I've bred and all the uteruses that ended up in a bucket. It's like, I don't I don't sell people dogs that they have to breed. It's like, I, in fact, I would prefer they don't because they don't know what they're doing and they could kill the bitch, the puppies. It can all go bad. But the, for the male, sometimes I'll ask, will you just allow me to retain st uh, stud rights and keep them intact? Because testicles are not poison. They're what nature put in there, right? And one lady said very vehemently, like, I will not keep a male intact. You know, I believe in rescue. And I'm like, well, why are you talking to a breeder then? Yeah. And she said, because I, I'm, I'm tired of dealing with rescue dogs that have problems. I just want a, a really healthy, you know, mentally sound puppy. I'm like, how do you think I make them? <laughs> you know, like she says, well, I believe in protecting my breed. So I do rescue. I'm like, I believe in protecting my breed too, which is why I produce good specimens. This is how I care for my breed. I make right. and I keep the gene pool going. And that set her back on her heels, but good. She's like, I never thought of that. I'm like, so if you take this wonderful dog, who's everything you want, and now you take his testicles and throw them away. How are you protecting the breed? Right. You had to go away and think about that. And she said, I never thought about that. I'm like, if you believe in rescue so much, go rescue one. The world's full of German shepherds that need homes. Yeah. If you yeah. one that's sound and solid and healthy, you can find one in the rescue world, but it's going to be a hunt. It's no fault of their own. It's just the reality of rescue, right? Right. I get really, really irritated when people show, they're just showing to say like, I have all these champions. It's like, but of all your champions I've seen, I'm not, I wouldn't breed to one of them. Yeah. So, and it should be, but there's no, there's no enforcement here. So I agree. You know, one of my bitches who was such an amazing producer, she had four litters. She just produced the nicest damn dogs. You know, and Spider is, is one of them. She had a, a bent over ear because she annoyed a golden retriever and he, he deserved to <laughs> crunch your ear. She was a jackass. But people were like, how can you breed her? So it was really funny. One time we showed her at some big match, like in Jersey area, there's a, a big match. And so we think, let's, let's take all the puppies. Let's take all the puppies and we'll take all four puppies that were, you know, still in the area and we'll take her and we'll show her and, open bitches. And so the judge dumps her to the absolute back of the class. Meanwhile, my guy that I had kept, who went on to be my search and rescue dog, he, she sends him to the, the puppy herding group, right? And then his brother was right behind him and his, his brother was right behind him and the other puppy won puppy bitch. So he took, you know, best puppy and then his sister took best opposite. 
And so that's who she sends the group. So at the end of the judging, I just went up and I said, I'm just curious, you know, thank you for placing the puppies. But with my bitch here, what is it, you know, that made you put her to the very back of the line? She was just rock solid, not particularly flashy or stylish. She was just solid and balanced. And she says, well, I'm sure she's very lovely and she has a nice temperament, but she's really not breeding material. I thought, is that right? Because this puppy here that you're sending to the herding group, that's her son. <laughs> Second male puppy, that was also her son. Third male puppy, also her son. Best puppy bitch, also her daughter. But thank you for your opinion. Um, mm. You don't understand, you know, when we're after championships or titles or after flashy show dogs, we're going to miss the really good stable dogs. Right. They're solid. They're not flashy. They're they're not whatever that year's style is. They're just good, solid specimens with no glaring faults. And that's what I'm usually looking for. No and, glaring faults. And sometimes it's like like I look at a lot of litters and I don't charge money for that. It's like any litters that people will let me get my hands on, especially breeds I don't do, you know, that aren't my breed. I love that. And I'll read the standard and I'll go. And there's been a lot of times where I am like, you know, I know why I can see why you like this one. <laughs> you know, I mean, usually I'm on, you know, pretty, you know, on the same uh, in alignment with the, with the breeders ideas, but sometimes there'll be, one that's really flashy, like the color is great or the color, or something is just, it's just beautiful. But you can see that this other individual is really going to have a lot of showmanship and he's, he's still stable, still beautiful, a little less flash. Sometimes it's even better. Sometimes the flash is actually overdone for a moderate breed. You know, we don't even want that much rear. We don't even want that much something, you know, this is actually more correct because it's more moderate. And people will be like, oh, we just can't, you know, this is what we've always wanted to produce. And it's like, well, it's not going to be fun to show. Cause I mean, if the dog doesn't like it or if, you know, if there's something else about their second pick, that's just like got a great phenomenal personality. It's like, I don't, I just don't know how you don't go for that. Especially if you want to have fun showing a dog. Because they're, they're stuck on the, the physical appearance. And this is my, my biggest criticism of the show world. They don't understand behavior and they don't understand temperament. So they might be experts at, at looking at confirmation. They might be able to spot the movement they want a mile away, but they often have no idea. The whole package for the show dog has to be a dog with what I call the Sandra D gene. Lucky for you. <laughs> I'm here. So just give her the ribbon. A member of breeder I assessed her litter of, of puppies and they were not particularly stable. And so one of them, it was a breed where the markings mattered, right? So it was uh, not a mismark, but better judges side than the other puppy, right? And she goes, so that's the one we're gonna keep. And I'm like, you are, this is not gonna be a happy dog. This is gonna be a miserable dog to show because she's not stable and she's, um, she's worried a lot and she's easily startled. And I said, this puppy, this puppy, who's not quite as extreme, has a little bit more tan on that side, whereas the other one has a perfect white collar. I said, this is the puppy you want. This puppy's going to be like, hey, everybody, I'm here. I'm your winner today. And she said, no, 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 you don't know. We've been in the breed forever. I'm like, okie dokie, I saw her three years later. I said, so how'd that work out? She goes, yeah, she was miserable to show, and we can't finish her. I'm like, you can't finish a dog who's slinking around the room with their tail tuxing, why, why, why did you bring me to this place again? And why the hell do you want to breed that one? Well, that that part is another whole we could talk about for seven hours. It's like, how is this what you want out there? Yeah. How is this what you want out? And this is what this is my personal thing. I look at any animal I'm gonna breed. I'm like, so what happens? What happens if I get 12 just like her? Mm. I am not okay with 12, exactly the spitting image of their mother, then I, I should not breed her. Yeah. I have to be okay with that package. So it's, it's very hard. I wish to God, if I had my little magic wand for the show world, I, I get it. I do. I am a breeder. I have slugged in my time being show secretary, trial secretary, run the maturities, maturities. That was before computers. So we had to calculate all the little <laughs> Like to the penny, and I had to count out the pennies and the nickels and put them in. 
Uh, all the entries were typed by hand. I'd done it, been there, right? Got up at the crack of whatever before sparrow fart, as as the Aussie <laughs> said. And uh, yeah, I've been there, done it, and I'm I'm done. But my job is, can I help breeders create emotionally, physically sound animals? And that's this starts before they're even sent to their new homes. So I'm, you know, that enriched puppy protocol I have is is all about take your genetics and polish them, right? You, you do all this work, you do all this stuff showing and you groom them and you do this and you do that and you pour over pedigrees and you go to shows and then you just leave your dogs to become pretty sterile in their brains. Yeah. You know, when I've worked with the big guide schools, we're, we're over 15,000 puppies raised my way now. So it's nice and quiet, it's behind the scenes, nobody's advertising it. But the difference in these dogs are so profound that in two schools, the staff believed that they had gotten new bloodlines, when in fact it was a repeat breeding of a litter they'd had just six months prior. So the difference, wow. my first call, they thought, oh, we got new bloodlines. Like, nope. and people can find that on your website, right? I have your yeah. website, but, yeah, you know, it's, it's laying down there. Good. Yep. That's awesome. That's that's my job. How do we help people create the happiest, most healthy, stable dogs? Because this is what keeps dogs out of out of shelters. This is what keeps dogs out of rescue. This is what keeps dogs in their homes till the day they die, which is should be any breeder's goal. Right. You place that puppy. Boy, that should be the right home. And so that means you have to understand behavior and you've got to understand everything that happens before that. We've got a, an easy webinar. You can find my my you know videos on demand page at my website there. But we have the easy webinar, which kind of gives an overview of the Enriched Puppy Protocol. And then coming in 2021 is an online course so that you can really dive deeply into what to do, how to do it. And uh, the difference it can make is... One, one Cavalier breeder stopped me at my vet's parking lot. She sees me in waves and she's come to a lot of my lectures and she rolls down the window and she goes, I blame you for everything. I'm like, okay, I get blamed a lot. So <laughs> what exactly have I done this time? She goes, I raised that last litter of puppies your way. And oh my God, I'm like, it didn't work. She goes, no, they were so bold and fearless. <laughs> You're like, oops. Yeah, I said, oh, did I forget to warn you about that part? Because, yeah, they can think it. They now can actually <laughs> do it. So that's quite frightening. Um, she goes, yeah, people were not prepared for how brilliant and coordinated and confident these puppies were. I'm like, that's that's a nice problem to have. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. So this is a nice comment from Crystal. She says, hi, Suzanne, really good stuff. Keep it rolling. Hi, Crystal. I know Crystal. Mm -hmm. And then Kathy said, I teach my puppies to eat anywhere, anytime, anything. I have them eat in their cage, on the grooming table, in the car. No eating problems here. And Tanya said, no breeding Fruit Loops. I love that. <laughs> Unless you want a bowl of cereal. Um, yes. Just don't breed Fruit Loops. That's my bumper sticker. No Fruit Loops. Okay, final question. Even though I'm sad this is going to end, but it's so great. What do you think it takes to be a breeder of influence? I don't know that I'd consider myself a breeder of influence, but I'll tell you what it takes to be a breeder. I had a friend who wanted, she she's, she's really loves this breed and she thought, I, I wanna be a breeder, you'll be my mentor. I said, okay. So next litter that we have, like you come and be there for the whelping and then come every week and help us with the puppies, no problem. So it turned into one of those nightmare breedings, uh, a nightmare whelping. So some infection set in. So the first two puppies are born dead um she eats half of one of them then we end up in an emergency c so it was just bad it was just bad it was just it was not as bad as coming home with an empty collar and an empty box right still came home with one puppy and the bitch herself that was stolen actually um two puppies born alive out of the whole thing the only cleft palate i've ever had they handed me one live puppy i said you checked for clefts right and they're like oh we forgot as soon as oh. I touched him, I could just feel like something's not right here. And there was the cleft. So I held him for about 10, 15 minutes and I handed him back and said, put him to sleep. Like, just that's the end of that. So I went home with one puppy and that was it. Heather's How like, was Stone? Stone was the one live puppy. Oh. To boot, he was a dilute blue sable. So now I go home with a dog who's the color of a Vimeroner. 
And I'm like, are there any vine runners in our neighborhood? Is this even a shepherd? Yeah, it was just a bad night. But Heather's like, I I don't want to be a breeder. This is yeah. how it can go. I'm like, it can go worse than this. So you have to have some kind of crazy commitment to seeing it through. And you have to be willing to risk your bitches. You're betting their life that you and your vet know enough to keep them alive. Always. Yeah. Uh, and you just have to have this ability to to suck up through the bad times. And it's 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 offset by the you know, the people that come back for their third or fourth dog from you and say, this dog changed my life. This dog healed my broken heart. This dog, it, it, there's just all these wonderful stories of what a great Get dog. Get snuggled up with their German Shepherd. What a great dog can do um, of any breed, what a great dog can do for the human heart and soul is, it's priceless. So if you're not committed to that, if you're just a, in it for the ego or the ribbons, then I don't know that that to me is a breeder. A, a breeder is a heart and soul thing. And you've got to have, you got to have a crazy bone in your head. Uh, that's quite large, actually. And you're like, yes, I think I want to do this again. And there's times when my husband and I look at each other, like, why are we doing this? Like, what makes us think this is good? And then we see the puppies or they, yeah. It's a, it's a passion thing. It is for sure. Do you guys plan to breed next year? If things are go ahead in a better direction, yeah, I'm I'm hoping to see what will happen. I'm I'm really not terribly hopeful that when she's in heat again, maybe the world will be in a better place and I can I can get to Michigan and, and breed her again. But if not, I'm watching her breeding years tick by. Yeah, and that's that's heartbreaking. Um, it just it is what it is, and that's the other reality of being a breeder. Like all your best plans, you've got to actually um, suck it up and, and know that you've got hopes and dreams. And then mother nature just chuckles and does whatever the hell she's going to do. Yes, she does whatever she wants. You're at the mercy of the, the dog gods for sure. Mm -hmm. and the pandemic. I really believe that that's mother nature's thing. I warned you. <laughs> I warned you. You Never didn't listen. And now I'm going to take some action. Do you remember that old that old margarine commercial? We're of an age, you and I, so you will remember it. <laughs> it's not nice to fool with Mother Nature. It's not nice to fool with Mother Nature. Yeah, exactly. Let's revive <laughs> that commercial and just play it nonstop until we all work it out. <laughs> Oh, Suzanne, thank you so much. This was so fun. I love you so much. I miss seeing you here in California, mm -hmm. and I'm excited to, to, to check out, especially that puppy one next year, but I think I'll do the webinar maybe this weekend, <laughs> maybe next weekend, sometime over this holiday. So many great comments. I was, you know, throwing a couple of them up there. Oh, Kelly Hawtrey, she's on here. You know, she has a couple new uh, St. Bernard. Big St. Bernard boy, a yeah, yeah, and he's got another one, and I and know. he's doing yeah, and he's doing really good. So she finished Finn, and now she's working. But a lot of a lot of really nice comments. People loved hearing about your your dogs and your breeding program, and I'm just so glad we did this. It was so fun to talk to you about your breeding program that you can just get to pick your brain about it, and you know, because I feel like I'm always asking and talking about um training so this is different this was good and so i hope it was super fun for you because well now people know right some people know there's people who are like i didn't know she she was a breeder i just find <laughs> that hysterically funny it's like yeah or they say like well what do you know about show handling i'm like never mind I'm like this, i don't know i read a national specialty winning dog but it, it's okay I, I know nothing <laughs> yeah, it's it's such a deep part of my background. But yeah, after 10 generations of like, she breeds shepherds? I did not know that. And I think, yeah, that's just too funny, sort of, not really. <laughs> <laughs> well, well that. Mm -hmm. a lot of us know, and a lot of, a lot of us have loved them from uh, afar. Even Christine, who was on here, and she commented a little while ago, I know she had one at one time that she named Rain after one of yours. So we love seeing your dogs and your um, presentations and stuff. It's really cool. You feel like you get to know them, you know? Well, that's a little creepy. I've had people at seminars say, was that so-and-so or so-and-so? I'm like, are you stalking my dog? <laughs> I don't even know. I have to look twice. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, that's rain. That's not spider. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, we, we do try to breed for a beautiful dog because not at the expense of anything else, but 
by and large, I tend to pick really beautiful dogs. And so they, they are quite appealing to the eye as well. And yeah. When they're brilliant, kind, they can do their job and they stay sound well into their very old age, it's a good thing. So thanks for letting me be on. And hey, I'm here anytime, whatever Great. I can. I would love to have you on again some yeah, point. Behavior, behavior for dog show people would be really, really interesting. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. That's the, you know, I the one thing I hate about dog shows is all the unhappy dogs. A dog who says, "Oh man, I love this. I'm so good at this. Watch me." Yeah. My search dog used to lay outside the ring with his paws crossed like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was time for open dogs. I'm like, "Okay, buddy, it's time to be beefcake." And he's like, "Get up. We'd brush him real quick." He's like, "Hello, hello." <laughs> And he would pose like, how's that mom? Pretty cool. And then he'd come back out and I, I'm like, thanks. He's like, okay. <laughs> that's what we want. We want him to just no. be like, okay, this is just something we do. That's cool that I do with my mom or my dad, you know? Yeah. It's, it's like fun thing. pretty instead of, you know, it, it's kind of like dragging someone out of the shower who's singing and like putting them on stage and America's got talent and go, you love to sing. It's like, <laughs> she's making me do this. I don't know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I think I think behavior for um, yeah folks interested in, in show dogs. I would I would love to do that with you. Oh my god, that'd be so great! Cool. Enjoy your holiday season and enjoy the rest of the time off you have. And I'm glad that even though all this sucks and it's been crazy, I'm glad that you're getting some time off and to do some other things you want to do and maybe just spend some time at home with your dogs. <laughs> I, I I misheard you. I thought you said all this sucks. I'm like, what? Where did? <laughs> Conversation. That's a completely different conversation, Vicky. Maybe that's another interview. <laughs> Weird places we've had. This is, I will tell you, this is where you realize that you're not normal. It was, it was New Year's Day at LL Bean, right? So we're like, let's meet in the very, very, very far par parking lot of LL Bean. And I had Stone with me as a baby, and I had his mom there as breeding her. And so the stud dog owner says, I'll meet you at LL Bean. It is, it is like 10 o'clock in the morning, a New Year's morning. Like who the hell's even awake? Never mind. <laughs> and so we picked a far, far parking lot. And so then we got the dogs and now they're tied and we're just standing there waiting. And this lady pulls up and I swear to God, there's like 200 open parking spots. <laughs> like you need to move. We're like kind of busy here. Like <laughs> park over there. So she flips us off and she's quite angry. And then this woman drives by with a station wagon full of kids <laughs> and looks over and is like, uh, <laughs> trying to like make the kids. Like, I'm like, why? There's four other parking lots at a time. Why are you here? I'm like, okay, this is when you realize you're not normal when you're like planning hot dates and LL Bean with your dogs and then horrifying children that drive by and it's all good. <laughs> it is all good. That, no, they no. probably thought it was a two headed dog. I mean, when <laughs> your mom had lots of explaining to do. And then there was also the emergency C-section with Brittany. So we had 10 puppies and for whatever reason, we didn't have a box. So I just, just put them in my, in my shirt. So I have all 10 puppies in my cleavage and you know, I didn't have a bra on. And in Jersey, we stopped for gas on the way home. And so in Jersey, the attendant has to pump gas for you. So I'm not thinking about him. I'm thinking about the puppies. And they're sort of getting loose and they're getting uncomfortable. So I just unbutton my shirt and I'm like picking up my boobs and I'm adjusting the puppy. <laughs> and as I'm doing that, I look up and the attendant's just standing there with his mouth hanging over. I was like, ah, yeah, I forgot about that part. And I, I learned later that some of the um, indigenous tribes, they would sometimes nurse puppies along with their babies, right? And I thought, ah, if I had known that then, I could have <laughs> smiled and says, this is the way of my people. <laughs> <laughs> it is the way of breeders, yes. It is not normal. And it's so funny you brought up bras. I'm like, are we even doing that anymore? <laughs> no, I love, I love this world. I just have to be like, okay, from here up. and. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> some of, some, sometimes John looks at me, he goes, going to work? I'm like, I'll have, like, you know, like PJs on the bottom, but I'll have like a reasonable looking top. And, like, it's what I call the work mullet. It's all, you know, business up top. It's all yeah. top. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right. Take good care. Thank you. you too. Let's do it again soon. You got it. All, all right. right. Bye, Vicki.